Welcome to the first ever Skeleton Key Study Group webinar with the Joseph Campbell Foundation. We are so happy you've joined us today for this conversation about goddesses and Campbell's work, which are two of my personal favorite topics. The Joseph Campbell Foundation invites you to experience the power of myth. So if you hear that call to adventure, you are in the right place. If there's one thing I hope you take away with you today, it's that. The Campbell Foundation invites you to experience the power of myth. The name of this webinar comes from one of Joseph Campbell's early publications, which was called A Skeleton Key to Finnegan's Wake, and it was a guide to reading James Joyce's novel. We are using that reference to Skeleton Keys as the name of our new series of study guides for books by Joseph Campbell. So for example, the Goddesses Study Guide accompanies Campbell's book, Goddesses, Mysteries of the Feminine Divine, right? These study guides are intended to companion you as you read Campbell's works, perhaps find yourself inspired by his ideas, and maybe even carry them forward in your own work. My name is Joanna Gardner. I am a mythologist, and I'm one of the authors of the Goddesses Study Guide, which we're going to talk about today. I feel very fortunate that we have two other Goddesses authors with us, Olivia Happel-Block and Stephanie Zachowski. The three of us will have a conversation, then we'll have some time for Q&A. So please feel free to send us your questions via the Q&A button on your Zoom screen at any time. And yes, we absolutely do have a promo code to share with you today. So if you can resist the temptation to do any book shopping during the webinar, you might find it worth the wait. But before we go on, I would love to introduce some of the Intrepid JCF team. And here they are. We have with us today the amazingly talented Tyler Lapkin, who is our podcast producer and social media coordinator. We also have the unstoppable Stephanie Zachowski, who I already mentioned is one of the Goddesses Study Guide authors. We have the one and only Stephen Geringer, our community coordinator and the author of Myth and Modern Living, and myself, a study guide author and editor and director of marketing and communications here at the foundation. And with that, I'll invite the team to turn on their videos and say hello and introduce themselves. Tyler, would you like to lead us off? I just want to thank everyone for being here with us today. Um, I'm Tyler Lapkin. I help with the podcast for the foundation and all those social media posts that you see on Instagram and, and Facebook and Twitter. I'm the guy who's who's posting those. So it's just great to have you all here today. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Stephanie. Yes, thank you. I, uh, I too am so excited to have everyone here with us today and have this conversation with all of you. Uh, I am Stephanie and I am the operations coordinator at the Campbell Foundation. So I'm responsible for ensuring that all the gears of the clock are running smoothly in the background. So most of my work is behind the scenes. Uh, I'm also a contributing author to the Goddesses Skeleton Study Guide and just thrilled to be here with you today. Thank you, Steph. Stephen. Uh, well, hello, everybody. I'm Stephen Geringer. I have been involved with the Joseph Campbell Foundation for 20 years. So I've just about figured my way around, worn a variety of hats, most revolving around community, which is why today's event really does my heart good, seeing so many in the myth-minded community here. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you so much to the team for your intros and for making today's webinar possible. This is a great time, everyone, to open up the chat if you haven't already. And let's hear a round of virtual applause for, for the team, for Tyler, Stephen, and Stephanie, and everything they do for the work of myth. And while you have the chat open, let's have a chat check-in. I see lots of people are, are already letting us know where you're Zooming in from, which is great. And if 
today. If you have a favorite goddess of the moment or goddesses of the moment, go ahead and share them in the chat as well. I am joining today from the Santa Barbara area, and the goddesses on my mind right now are the muses, who I kind of think of as the patron saints of the study guide series. Tyler, do we have any other goddesses popping in via the chat by any chance? Let's see, we have uh, Persephone, Aphrodite, Venus, Artemis. Oh, we got a bunch coming in. Wonderful. Isis, wonderful. there's all kinds. All right, thank you so much. But well, we welcome all the goddesses who are joining us today. Okay, so before I introduce today's guest of honor, I would like to tell you what is in a study guide. St skeleton keys can open many locks because they've been filed down to the essentials, right? Skeleton key study guides work the same way. We designed these books to help teachers, students, creatives, book clubs, and really all myth-minded readers to discover Campbell's insights and experience the power of myth, and that includes you. In a study guide, in a skeleton key study guide, you'll find concise chapter summaries of Campbell's chapters, plus reading lists and prompts for discussion topics, essay topics, and creative projects. So let me just show you. Um, so this is the this is the the cover, a close up of the cover of of the goddesses skeleton key study guide, and this is one of the quotes from Campbell's book, which coincidentally you'll also find in the study guide. Um, but this is kind of one of the ideas that the study guide unpacks. It is through the goddess that you enter the world of the spirit. She is the maze and she is also your guide. And I'd like to show you also what it looks like inside the study guide. This is page one of chapter one. And as you can see, Stephanie wrote this chapter. The chapter title is Myth and the Feminine Divine. And the chapter begins here with the beginning of the chapter summary. And then I'm going to jump ahead to some pages a little further in the book. These pages are from a chapter that Olivia wrote about um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which is kind of one of her areas of specialty. You can see on the left hand side, she, Olivia has written points of interest from that chapter. And then on the right hand side are reading lists and discussion questions. And I'm just going to turn the virtual page here. And the chapter goes on to, to offer some essay topics and a quote that Olivia has chosen. And then the chapter closes with a list of creative prompts. And that's kind of that's kind of the approach that you'll find chapter by chapter inside the study guide. And with that, it gives me great joy to introduce Olivia Happelblatt. Come on up to the virtual front of this virtual room, Olivia and Stephanie both. And Olivia, I'll just read your bio and then we'll, we'll go into our conversation. Olivia Happelblock is an English, myth, and film studies instructor at Dos Pueblos High School in Goleta, California. She also serves as the English department chair and the International Baccalaureate Extended Essay Coordinator. And she teaches dual enrollment English for Santa Barbara City College on the high school campus. Olivia has served as the Pacifica Graduate Institute Alumni Association's president. She has presented at the American Academy of Religion Regional Conference, the Pop Culture Association's regional and national conferences, and the Fates and Graces Mythologium. Her academic interests include myth, religious studies, alchemy, and classics. So let's hear it for Olivia in the chat. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you. And thank you. With that, I will stop the slide share. So here we go. Let's see how the tech cooperates. Are we, how are we doing? Are we doing good? All right. Okay, great. Well, so thank you so much for joining us, Olivia and Stephanie. Thank you too for joining us. And I would just love to begin our conversation um, with sort of, you know, a foundational question. And that is what drew you to myth? 
you know, back in the long ago times before you were actually a mythologist. And let's let's begin with Olivia and then we'll go to Stephanie. So Olivia, what drew you to myth? So one of my first experiences with myth uh, come, came through reading the Royal Diaries uh, series on Cleopatra, where she mentioned Isis quite a bit. Um, and that led me to borrow my mom's big book on Cleopatra um, and to just become fascinated with images of the goddess Isis. And then in high school, I took Latin and we had to pick Latin names and I was bound and determined to get Aphrodite as my Latin name. Um, and by the time I was a senior in high school, we were reading Virgil's Aeneid in Latin. Um, and I decided to major in Latin for secondary education. So I was reading through lots of Greek and Roman myth. Um, and then I just kept studying it. It just hooked me and, and kept me going. Thank you, Olivia. The, uh... Your story has a feeling of faith to me, you know, just sort of inescapable. Thank you. Stephanie, how about you? What drew you to myth? What drew me to myth? Um, I was really sitting with this question because there's many moments that I can, you know, capture. But if I really think about like embedded myth into like the bones of my being, it's the fact that I was surrounded by storytellers as a child. You know, I can remember my grandparents telling me stories while sitting under pecan trees or hiking through the creek and my parents reading, <clears throat> pardon me, and reciting stories to me when I was afraid or curious or just for fun. So storytelling was everywhere around me. And I think that that laid a foundation that really was a yearning for me in my life. Like things felt empty if there wasn't more to it, more storytelling, more myth as part of it. And so it allowed for those later moments when I encountered myths and books and different things for those to resonate really deeply and call me to further exploration. And I think that really made it where I courageously followed that thread, continually said yes to that calling to myth over and over and over again, even when, you know, it defied logic at times, so. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly does sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> and yet it, it defies a, a certain kind of logic and it is imperative to a different kind of logic, right? Thank, thank you, Steph. Thank you for sharing that. That really uh, underscores for me, um, it's a snapshot of, of what we've been talking about, of experiencing the power of myth, right? That that calling just kind of kept kept pulling at you like a magnet, it sounds like. Thank you. Um, so, and that kind of leads into my next question, which is, um, what, how, what do you think of as the most important reason to study myth? You know, we love myth, yay, and, and why study it? Um, and with this question, I think let's go in the reverse order. Let's go, let's go Stephanie and Olivia. So, so reflecting on, and you don't have to keep it to just one one answer like you know what are what is the most important reason or reasons to study myth let's let's call it that stephanie Ooh, reasons there's a lot of reasons but one of them with this question what i immediately think of this image comes to mind over and over again and it's i think a medieval image of an alchemist um who is floating on the edge of the earth and pulling aside the veil right to see the stars and the heavens and the inner workings of the universe and I think Campbell talks about this, especially in the goddess book over and over again, um, that pulling the veil and opening. Um, and while, you know, myth doesn't necessarily answer all the questions, it opens pathways to deeper understandings of the human conditions in a way that offers a great deal of meaning to me. Um, you know, as Campbell says, what myths point beyond themselves to a mystery. So I often say that as I got deeper and deeper into the study of mythology, the world around me started to dance. It came to life for me. So for me, the study of myth is a ticket to the dance. It's a ticket to the dance of the universe. It provides visibility into the interplay that's all around us. So that'd be my Love why. That. <laughs> so, okay, can you say that again? A ticket to dance, what was the next part? It's a ticket to the dance of the universe. A ticket to the dance of the universe. Hashtag, that's, I love that. <laughs> um, and, and pulling back the veil also, right? Both, both of those are images. Both of those are powerful images of, of kind of, you know, the power of myth. Thank you, Steph. Olivia. 
most important reason or reasons to study myth? What I always tell my students in my mythology classes is that myth tells us what it means to be human. Um, they can tell us what it was for people in the past, for people in different cultures, and people from different walks of life. There's a reason that watching someone like Luke Skywalker trust the Force and shoot down the Death Star can give us a catharsis in the same way that watching Antigone stand up for her beliefs against tyranny did for the people of Athens. When we engage with myth, we engage with our human selves throughout time, space, and place. And we are able to understand the trials and tribulations of what our very human life throws at us. So myth is, is the way to help us with that, to help us cope, to help us understand, to give us insight, and, and to help us through those walks of life. Yeah, thank you. And can you repeat the very first sentence? It show, Myth shows us what it means to be human. Was that it? That's it. Yeah. It shows us what it means to be human. Again, um, yeah, that, that's, that's a hashtagable, I would say. Um, yeah, and I agree. I agree completely with both of you. And, you know, we could go on. We could have a whole webinar about about the reasons to study myth, um, but but those are those are two excellent ones. So thank you. Um, and and so we're not going to talk about that topic the whole webinar. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, let's go to our next question. My next question is about Joseph Campbell. Um, you know, we're here with the Campbell Foundation, so would love to hear your Campbell origin story. Like, how how did you first find Campbell? And what was that experience like for you? And, and let's go reverse order again this time. Let's go Olivia and then Stephanie. So Olivia, what is your Joseph Campbell origin story? So my, my story is it kind of faded again. Um, in my freshman English class, um, we had to read The Hero's Adventure from The Power of Myth as one of our required readings. And Campbell hooked me right away. Um, Mrs. Whitmer, she was my teacher. She required us to have all of our own copies of the books we read in order to practice annotation. And my mom found this amazing copy at a half price bookstore that's the large edition with all the images and um, just gorgeous like full page illustrations, giant margins to write in. And I, I was hooked. I just, this was this amazing text. So I read through this section for class. I read through the whole book. I asked for the power of myth uh, for Christmas and as well as the hero with a thousand faces. I don't know how many 14 year olds are out there asking for Campbell books and DVDs for Christmas, but um, Santa brought them. So thank you. Um, and just analyzing literature through Campbell's um, way of viewing the world changed my own perspective. It changed how I saw myth and religion um, and being able to include his own text in my teaching is just a gift that keeps on giving. Um, when I had posted about this webinar, I actually had a student reach out to me and say, hey, like you said that Campbell changed your life. Well, when you had us read Campbell, it kind of changed my life too. So um, I think it's just such an insightful um, way of approaching myth, of approaching religion, of approaching thought and psychology. Um, and it all comes together in this really interdisciplinary way that um, just is so unique and, and world changing. So um, I do want to just say thank you again to Mrs. Whitmer for being my call to adventure. I will underscore that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitmer, especially if you're if you're watching today. Um, and it's so funny, you know, we've been talking about experiencing the power of myth, and you experienced the power of myth through the power of myth. <laughs> so, so I like I like that circle. It's like the Euroboros, right? Stephanie, how about you? Your your Campbell origin story. My Campbell origin story. Well, I, I'm again going to bring up my parents. They were Campbell fans, so I was introduced to Campbell early on. Um, and I do remember the impact of the Bill Moyers interview um, fairly clearly, but, I, you know, if I'm completely honest with myself, I wasn't ready at that point to enter the work of Campbell myself. I don't think I was mature enough. So it was <laughs> in my 30s um, 
that I went back to my parents' bookshelf and found The Power of Myth and took it with me on a trip. And that was kind of the call. I was enamored and just yearning to speak that language, to have a deeper understanding there. So I would say that is when the true journey began. And it was really through Campbell that I found graduate school, that I found it. So that was the doorway. But I also, if you'll indulge me for another little moment where I think um, was my moment with Campbell was, um, in graduate school, you know, they housed the Joseph Campbell archives there and the library was slow that day. So I went in and politely asked if I could view the archives <laughs> and they're like, sure. And they let me in and they gave me, you know, the incredible gift of time. So I had the reading list from our graduate program at the time, what we were reading in our courses. And I went into Campbell's library and I pulled those books. And I got to look at the notes in the margins, right? They, you know, I gently opened the text. I was reading the margin notes where Campbell had written. And it was just a magical moment for me because I was witnessing him pondering the same ideas, making associations, building connections. And there was just like this, I don't know, human linkage. It was just magical to see the lineage of the study of myth and to be in that space. So that was the Campbell memory that popped up for me. That's so awesome. And that word lineage, I think, is important. Um, it, you, that sounds to me like a, a story, a very vivid story of experiencing lineage, um, which, you know, we are all in. The, the three of us are for sure in Campbell's lineage. And I would venture to say that everyone on this call today is, is walking in Campbell's footsteps, in a sense. Um, and my hope is that as I've seen the, the myth community, the contemporary myth community enter into that work and pick it up and carry it forward in their own way. Um, that's, that's you know, I see both of you doing that in your careers and, and I, I offer that hope for the larger myth community that more and more people take up that mantle because I, I, I believe the world is, is a richer place when that happens. I know the world is a richer place for the work that the two of you are doing. So, okay, sorry, I can tell I'm going off on a tangent. I'll come back. Okay, so um, next question. Next question is an easy one. Your favorite quote or passage from goddesses? And let, let's go in the same order, Olivia and then Stephanie. Olivia, what's your favorite quote? Would you like to read it? So mine comes from the chapter on the Iliad and the Odyssey, which as Joanna mentioned, that's part of my specialty, um, especially working with Trojan War stories and things like that. Um, so this is Campbell talking about um, the purpose of the Odyssey in general and of Odysseus's quest here. And Campbell says, as I see it, the quest of Odysseus is to return home decently to Penelope, his wife not to a blonde, not to someone who is the victim and booty of war, but to his wife. A wife is someone with whom one is in counterplay as the other side of the mystery, mystery of the Andron. And so Odysseus has to be debriefed from his warrior attitude and where there is no idea of dialogue between the male and female powers. That's on page 160 if you're trying to follow along. So when I first read this quote, it made a lot of sense to me because a lot of times when we read the story of the Odyssey, we think, why did it have to be 10 years? Why did it have to take so long for Odysseus to get home? Um, and, you know, oh, he was cursed by the gods, Poseidon, no, 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 okay, but really 10 years? Um, but this actually reminds me of something that happened between my grandparents um, my grandpa was a Marine who served three tours in Vietnam. Um, and even uh, when he left the military, he became a mailman. Um, but before he would come home, before he would come in and the family would have dinner, um, my grandma insisted that they had to have what she called attitude adjustment time, which is where they would share a glass of wine or a cocktail and a little snack before dinner, before engaging with one another. Um, and as a little girl, I participated with this with lemonade and Cheez-Its, um, but it was the time for him to leave the Marine at the door. That's what my grandma said. He had to leave the Marine at the door to become a husband and a father. Um, and so Odysseus's journey represents this time needed to change one's, um, one's mythical mode of existence. 
I attended a lecture in Grand Rapids a few years ago, and therapists were talking about using the Odyssey and the Iliad to help veterans of war process their PTSD um, and the, the way to return to civilian life, how to go from soldier to civilian. Um, and I think that this story and the use of this mythical story in something like therapy um, it just shows that need for transition and shows how one can transition in talking about the ego and deflatement and things like that. And I also think that this, this passage brings up a really interesting opportunity for discussion on the term and the idea of wife. Um, because what Campbell is talking about here, it is a partner, it is your teammate. Odysseus isn't returning to Ithaca for funsies, that's where he belongs. He belongs as the king ruling besides his queen. And so to do so successfully, to be a well-functioning father, husband, king in person in general here, he has to change back to that persona, which is going to take so much time and energy, that 10 years. So the idea here, and this is a fun place where we can take Campbell's ideas and expound them in ideas of gender and sexuality and what these mean to the modern world here, the, the wife is the partner. It is the other you. It's the one with whom you must be in right relationship with in order to function as a pair. So um, there's just a lot of really great insights that Campbell has that I think we can take and move even forward, forward with these ideas into the modern world. That is so awesome. Thank you so much, Olivia. I mean, your your the the quote and your reflections just make it real. Um, and and really, you know, demonstrate the applicability of of these archetypes and motifs ongoing. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, and remind me again. So the 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 reason to study myth was to understand what it is to be human. Right. And so, yeah, the story you just shared perfectly, perfectly supports that point. <laughs> so well done. Um, and yeah, it, uh, you, what you shared gives me a sense of what it's like to be in your classroom. So thank you so much. Stephanie, your favorite quote or, or passage? Sorry. Yes. Well, I have tons and I feel like I'm cheating because the one I pulled out to talk about today was the one you read at the beginning. <laughs> not cheating, not cheating. <laughs> But I think, so it is It is through the goddess that you enter the world of the spirit. She is the maze and she's also your guide. And I think why I'm drawn to that one so much is it's such a prevalent theme that I'm drawn to throughout the goddess book in uh, the transformation that's constantly talked about through the goddess and how, you know, she is with you, uh, an intermediary amidst all the mysteries. So for me, the quote just encapsulates those transformative capabilities. And I believe that's why I'm drawn to that one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so our next question. Let me consult my magic question list. Oh, right. Okay, so next question. How how do you imagine the best way to use this book, the study guide, right? Your how how would you suggest people use this book from your unique perspective, Olivia as a teacher and mythologist, Stephanie as a coach and mythologist, or any of the other hats that you wear? I know you both do many, many things. So yeah, just would love to to hear your perspective on on how readers could could make the best use of, of this book. And let's go backwards again. Let's go Stephanie and then Olivia. So Stephanie. Sure, yeah. Uh, so yes, like Joanna said, I am a coach. So I think from that perspective, I find the creative prompts very useful. I think uh, clients are often struggling to reconnect to their purpose, their calling, their inner self, um, to recenter when life's thrown you for a crazy loop as it does. So these creative prompts provide opportunities for that reconnection, I think. Um, but I think it's even deeper than just reconnecting to self. It's reconnecting to the collective. And, you know, Olivia spoke to this beautifully a moment ago, but um these myths and this text span thousands of years. So these myths are tapping into ancient archetypal patterns. And I think the beautiful thing with myth is that it reveals this patterning to us, that we're often able to see our own life experiences in these patterns. Um, so it, it allows us to kind of lay down those life experiences 
is into this greater archetypal network, right? And giving it deeper meaning, like Olivia was saying, you know, really understanding our humanity and how we get meaning uh, through that in this universal architecture. So myths reflect back to us who we are. And I think that's very useful in coaching just as a way of opening up into that because you're reading a myth and you're journaling about a myth, but it's it's going deeper. It's always going deeper. So that's one. But then also I've had friends approach me excited about the book saying they would love to use it as a book club. And I think in that sense, like the discussion questions with a glass of wine would be amazing to sit and chat with all your friends about just all these conversation starters that are in the book itself. So those are the two ways I'm excited to utilize the book. I, I'm in. On the best one book club, <laughs> we can we can do it tonight. <laughs> but so so yeah, so so reconnecting with oneself and kind of understanding one's life, right? The kind of the the big picture possibilities and the the book club, the wine and book club. Don't forget that. So awesome, thank you, Steph, Olivia. Your perspective on the best way to use this book. I would also like to join the book club. Thank you very much. Um, so as a teacher, um, and especially in um, a college setting, I would see definitely giving this as a study guide or sections up to students who want more engagement with the goddesses text or maybe need a little extra help with it to kind of make th their way through some of Campbell's language or maybe some periods of history that they're not so familiar with. Um, the points of interest and discussion questions are a great place for both classroom discussion, but also places for students to dive deep into myths, traditions, and the ideas that Campbell has included here. Um, as a student, I could see myself using some of these essay prompts or discussion questions to do some of my own investigation or writing assignments, um, or maybe to uh, put together a paper for a conference presentation. Um, there's so many interesting and engaging ideas throughout the text, and I think what we've done in each chapter in pulling out the, the points of interest, the discussion questions, the creative prompts, the essay prompts, there is now not only the great text, but now you have all these little inroads into the text. So um, it allows for each person, whatever they're interested in, their own path into the goddess's text. Awesome. Thank you. I love that phrase, the little inroads into the into the ideas. That's terrific. Okay, you, you, you're both doing amazing. So last question, last question for me anyway, and then we'll we'll um, take a look at the Q&A. So everyone, if you have questions for Olivia and Stephanie, now's the time to put them in the Q&A. I think you click a Q, the button at the bottom of the screen that says Q&A. Click that and type your question in, and then we'll we'll lift up the questions for conversation here. But so my last question is, do, do you have any final advice for readers or, or words of wisdom to share? Um, your wish maybe for, for people who, who read this book. Uh, and let's go backwards again, just to keep things interesting. Let's go Olivia and then Stephanie. Olivia. Um, so I think that um, this text is this invitation, right? It's kind of what Stephanie was talking about. What's the invitation to the dance? Um, it allows us to engage with the goddess, um, but I think it's also important to maintain respect for boundaries of individual cultures and traditions. Um, comparative mythology is such a fascinating and fun topic, um, and it's a great source of study. But we also have to remember that each myth, each story, each deity, each society does have their own context. And as mythologists, we want to be respectful and acknowledge that. But we also can be curious, right? We can look at the connections and applications of Campbell's work and how it has continued to evolve and change and will continue to evolve and change as myths, as stories, as humans, we with our very human lives and very human selves, continue to evolve and change. Um, as I was reading through our sections, um, I was really struck by something about the comparison of the Trojan hero Hector and, and the Iliad and having to go out and fight, even though he knows he's going to lose. Um, and Campbell compares him to the 
the Indian hero Arjuna, the Bhagavad Gita, um, and his questioning of going into battle. Um, and I think there's even another further application with the new Oppenheimer film coming out, um, the, the idea of the reluctant soldier, but who's still dutiful. I think this is such an important question and topic, um, and the mythical connections are there. Um, so it just shows how it's going to keep coming up. Myth is here. It's not going anywhere. Um, and so when we're open to it, when we're listening to it and looking for those connections, um, it, it allows us to keep thinking and keep talking um, and maybe have some new insights into our very human lives. Thank you. Myth is not going anywhere. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Stephanie, final wishes, final advice, final, final anythings before we go to the Q&A. Yes, final wishes. I, I just want to get excited a minute about Olivia because I also love that question you pose about duty and what does it mean in these myths and what does it mean now today? And I just think that's such a fascinating discussion topic. And that's one of the questions that you pose in the book too. And I just, I love that idea. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so wanted to go there, but also my wish. Okay, my wish. <laughs> so it, it's going to sound dramatic, but you know, the study of myth, these things, it was life changing for me. Um, and so each of these, like Olivia just said, they're all doorways. These, these books are doorways for you. So myth for me offered me the ability to see the beauty around me, gave me a sense of understanding that I did not have before and a sense of self-acceptance. So I would love for readers to find this for themselves. Uh, and I would offer that if you're just entering this work, now is the perfect time. This is your place. This is where you're supposed to be. And so thrilled you're here. If you've been here for a while, that every rereading will offer new insights and inspirations to you. So stay open to that. And you know, once you see the mythic patterning, you see the gears of the universe at play everywhere. Oh, thank you, Steph. What a what a goddess blessing that was. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, and so, so before we go to the QA, just big round of applause for Olivia and Stephanie. Let's hear it in the chat for Olivia and Stephanie for all the work they, they did on this guide and for, for sharing their thoughts with us today. And with that, Stephen, can can you come on video and and um wondering if we have any questions in the chat to discuss? We do have quite a few and uh Unfortunately, sometimes it's hard to answer these in just sound bites, so we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, let's start with the first question that came in, which is, can someone with bipolar disorder be a modern day Persephone? Olivia and Stephanie, would either are, are either of you drawn to this question? I mean, my first thought is, why not? But... <laughs> Um, I mean, that that image feels very resonant. Um, I think I, I am not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so uh, limited ability to to comment on, you know, diagnostic issues. Um, but yeah, you know, Persephone rising, descending, rising, descending. What do you have any thoughts? Any myth you identify with is the myth you identify with. No matter what stage you're at, what you know, if you have whatever diagnoses you have, like if you identify with the myth, then why not? Like embrace a mythic diagnosis, right? A diagnosis of Persephone. Okay. Yeah, I think if that's calling to you, follow that calling. I think that's saying something to you and find meaning in that. Absolutely. All right, well, let's throw out another one. A relatively short one is Vivian from the Arthurian and Merlin legends, who if memory serves, and it doesn't always serve me, I believe she was the lady of the lake. Uh, is she considered a goddess, perhaps one of the Celtic goddesses? What an excellent question to explore. Um, I mean, again, like if that question is coming up for for anyone, if it's coming up for you, the the questions become why why am I hearing goddess echoes here? What's going on? What's happening in this image? And lifting that image and putting the image in its context, seeing what was going on 
historically around when when the image arises and and listening from from your I'll say positionality today right what what images are are what echoes and images are surfacing in that image and is there are is there anything coming up that you could think of as the feminine divine right it's not like there's like a, a an official book somewhere that identifies what all the goddesses are and are not um and it's like the spirit of the goddess or the goddesses is very much everywhere so so yeah listening into that image for for the sacred and uh and and how how that connects with you right um olivia stephanie any thoughts on that one on vivian is is she a goddess? the question is is she a goddess right so a very simple straightforward question to which i just gave kind of a very roundabout answer um would love to hear your thoughts as well well i think campbell writes quite a bit about how you know older goddesses oftentimes much more powerful goddess figures are kind of brought into marriage with younger gods or uh put as daughters and and kind of restoried in those ways so i think uh like you were saying following that intuition like hmm there's some resonances there's some goddess kind of imagery in this figure that's probably um actually quite valid because you know these these stories were put into certain contexts to associate with certain cultural meshings that were happening historically. So uh, the stories are constantly evolving and they are echoes of more ancient, often very powerful goddess figures in many ways. So. I think too, if if she has become a goddess that you have seen working in, in the, the stories or um, your own thoughts, your own practice, your own research, like, okay, sure, she can be a goddess. I don't think she would object knowing her character. I think she's fine with it. There we have it. Vivian's totally fine with being a goddess. All right, the questions are pouring in now. Uh, I'll jump to one that has a little bit of a preamble. It might appear complex, but actually, I think it's relatively simple. So I'll try to summarize. This is from Jill, who uh, talks about how a key theme uh, throughout, uh, I'm not sure which chapter she's discussing, is that in these early goddess mythologies, the procreative female body is a physical manifestation of the mystery of transformation in nature, life, and death. These connections form ideas about gender and the complex lives of women, even beyond that, the procreative metaphor. Campbell suggests that all women have mythic powers within themselves. I'm going to skip ahead over a biblical. Well, actually, I'll jump to this quote from Genesis 1. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep water. The Ruach Elohim was hovering over the water. Uh, and the question is, who shut the sea behind? Oh, no, this is from Job. The question is, did Campbell ever dig deeper? into the translation of the Old Testament to see how the goddess shines brightly throughout. You know, Stephen, that's probably a better question for you. <laughs> Stephen, by the way, everyone has a near encyclopedic knowledge of Campbell's Ove. So, <laughs> um, do you? Yeah, so, I, mean, I don't know of a place where he like really truly goes all in on Genesis. Do you? Uh, a few different places. I would suggest Occidental mythology. And frankly, I came to Campbell because I loved the soup. I didn't know a thing about myth. But he does discuss how Tohu and Bohu, you know, without form and void in Genesis 1, uh, and also the word Tihom, the spirit of God moved over the deep. The word for deep is Tihom. Those are both related etymologically to Tiamat the dragon goddess whom Marduk destroys and fashions the earth from when, you know, the Semitic and um, the Sumerian civilizations bumped into each other. So he does go into that quite a bit. In, in Occidental mythology. In Occidental mythology and other places. Uh, part of the problem with Campbell is that sometimes it takes a lot of reading to find where he discusses these. It definitely appears elsewhere, but I'd point 
uh, everyone to Occidental mythology as a place to begin with that, that transition from goddess to god uh, as civilization developed. Uh, unless anyone has anything to add to that, we can jump ahead to another question. Absolutely. Uh, and very relevant today, how would you approach this from a more decolonized, less Eurocentric lens? Great question. I'm Native American. This is the questioner, not me. So I find a lot of this I have to discover and figure out for myself to make it applicable for people I help within indigenous cultures. Well, so, so first of all, you know, the, the literature on decolonization, um, you know, bringing, entering into that study and bringing those ideas to bear on whatever text you're looking at, whether that's a myth or whether that's a Campbell text, right? Edward Said, I'm thinking of, um, and, uh, you know, the, the vast literature on decolonization, that's how to carry Campbell's work forward. Um, you know, the world has changed since Campbell wrote what he wrote, and, you know, there are so many more ideas and theories and, and possibilities for, for picking up like I said, a myth or Campbell's work and carrying it into a place of decolonization. And I think that field is so exciting and so full of possibility. And, and you know, part of the joy is um, really entering into conversation with scholars who are part of the community of whatever whatever myth, uh, you know, you want to work with. And there's, there's more and more out there. So finding, um, you know, I'm thinking of John Mohawk, and uh, the indigenous the the indigenous material from you know what is now upstate New York the Haudenosaunee people um, there's just so much amazing uh, there are so many more amazing books now than there were 50 years ago that can that can address that that incredibly worthy goal and and I I would just say do it do it do it please do it because the world needs it the world needs you to do that work. And I, I will stop talking. I apologize. I, I can hear myself doing it again. Olivia and Stephanie, any thoughts on, on that question? I think the, the best way to do it is to start with that attitude of respect um, and, and having respect for each culture, each tradition. Um, something I tell my students when we shift from ancient, ancient uh, mythologies to more uh, modern ones when we're talking about mythologies that are still practiced in the world today. Um, and I, I, I talk to them about how, you know, it's it, fine. We can laugh. Zeus and Hera. Yeah. Their brother, their sister. Yes. We talk about the alchemical thing because alchemical stuff and the union of opposites, but okay, fine. Have a laugh. That's okay. But when we shift into more um, practices that are still, uh, still ongoing living practices, I talk about how we want to be careful about what we're saying, where we're saying, ew, that's weird or things like that. You know, okay, it might feel strange. It might feel different. It might feel totally foreign to you, um, but we can hold that. We can hold that uncomfortableness with the unknown, with the different, um, and understand that these are people, that these uh, traditions have been practiced for thousands of years, um, and we want to to be open to that, to hearing how other people think and feel and believe um, and understanding the value of that, how valuable it is for um, people to believe and think differently than us. So having and starting with that attitude of respect and um, and, and non-judgment, right, of going into it and just listening. Let me let me learn these stories um, and without trying to take them, without trying to appropriate them, um, let me listen to what you have to say, which I think is just a good attitude in general for everyone. Yeah, thank you. Steph, any thoughts? No, oh, that's beautiful. I think, <laughs> and what you said earlier, Olivia, about comparative mythology and kind of how incredible and inspiring it is, and also how it can be some slippery slopes to some other components. And I think for us that go in and study this stuff, it's it's critical for us to have a critical eye and to ask questions and to look at the perspectives of the people writing and to also, you know, include voices of other perspectives and other ways. So yeah, I would 
constantly say to be vigilant of being curious um, in, in a yes and kind of way. I mean, that these ideas have inspired so many for so long. And how are they evolving? How are they changing? How are we introducing new ideas into these spaces? Um, I think that's funny. what we're here to do. Thanks very and, much. And for me, it also involves kind of a, a regular and continual checking in with my biases and my assumptions and my motives and, um, and trying to step back a little bit or a lot sometimes and and you know let 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 myself be be changed like like instead of colonizing right um becoming receptive and um and and i mean you know one of my core beliefs is you're always allowed to change your mind and and letting letting the the voices of others who others other than me Right. Um, if if it was just me, what a horrible world this would be. And so, so gratitude to all the all the myths out there, and all the mythologists, and all the people who are, are working in the field. Stephen, so we are coming up on time. We have we probably have time for. Let's do let's do one or two more questions, depending on how complex. How Very complex good. And let me throw this out there, too, because I'm not the technical wizard here, but it would be wonderful if we could capture these questions after the webinar is over and address them. A lot of people have their names on them. Uh, Monica from Brazil mentions it would be a great idea to do the book club over Zoom with wine and is looking forward to the foundation doing that. Uh, here is a question from a male. Uh, John Booker, for all the panelists, where is your curiosity taking you in your study of goddesses? What's next? What a great question from John Booker. Um, let's see, who wants to go first? Olivia or Stephanie, is anything coming up for you just right off the bat where your curiosity is taking you in the study of goddesses? Um, well, I am considering adding and changing a few things in my myth class for that I'll be teaching starting again this fall. So um, a few things that way. And then, um, there's a, a project that is is slowly being worked upon that's not quite ready to come out into the light of day yet, but um, goddesses will will come up again. So it's it's kind of still in the cave. It's a little dark. There's a little bit of light, but um, it hopefully in the next couple of months we'll be able to to talk about that and that will be coming forward. Um, but definitely want to keep engaging with the goddesses and tradition, um, and of course with Campbell. I mean that I do that every year. So awesome! Thank you, Steph. Yeah. Um, so what immediately comes up to me? My my doctoral research was around the uh, Christian apocalypse and looking at a figure within the Christian apocalypse who is the whore of Babylon and kind of the lineage of um, earlier goddesses that 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 she references so um that is kind of where I, my exploration is is taking me at this point well further into that those depths awesome thank you for for me I, I i you know at the beginning of the call i i mentioned the muses and the muses are on my mind um my my doctoral research um, focused on myth and creativity, you know, the creative process and, and the many, many ways that that intersects with myth and, and how important myth can be to creativity, both as a, as an image of creativity and as an inspirer of creativity. And I didn't talk about the muses, like, at all. <laughs> and so that just seems like, like, wow, let's, let's go there. Um, that just sounds really fun to me right now. So, so thank you to John for, for that fun question to end on. And thank you to Stephen. Round of applause in the chat, everyone, for Stephen, for, for coordinating the community <laughs> the way he does so beautifully. Um, okay, so we are almost at time. And before we go, I want to share my slides again. So here is, this is always the fun moment when we find out if technology will cooperate. And... Here we go. Do we have SlideShare? Is it working? Do we see slide? Yay. Okay. So 
Here is at long last the promo code that we promised you. Um, so the promo code is goddess, capital G, capital O, capital D, D, E, S, S. And this promo code is good on the jcf.org shop. It's not good on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of those places. And the discount is $9.99 for the ebook bundle of goddesses and the goddesses study guide. So, so you can find that ebook you can find that bundle on uh, the shop. If you go to jcf.org and click the little shop link, you can get to this bundle and put in the promo code goddess when you check out and the price will be discounted down to $9.99 for you. And everything, any ebook that you purchase on the jcf.org site is 100% tax deductible. All the proceeds go to supporting the foundation and we send you our deepest gratitude for supporting the work that we do. And I wonder, um, Tyler, could we drop the eBundle link into the chat? Oh, it looks like Tyler has already dropped all the links into the chat. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so let's go on. Before we wrap up, I want to share one final piece of news with you, and that is that you are the first to hear that the next study guide in the series is now available. It went on sale today on Amazon and the jcf.org shop. Um, so it's it's for Myths to Live By, Campbell's book, Myths to Live By, and it's written by Catherine Svela, who will be joining us for another one of these webinars in about a month. On August 5th, we'll have another webinar to talk about this study guide with Catherine. So you can register today for that webinar, and we hope you do. Go to jcf.org slash study guides, and you'll find, you'll find a button to register for that webinar. And um, yeah, mark your calendar, save your spot, and, and we'll be talking about more myth then. And with that, I just wanna thank you again for joining us today. Thank you to Tyler and Steven and the whole JCF team. Thank you to Olivia and Stephanie. We will leave the webinar open for a few minutes so you can wrap up any chat conversations that are going on and copy out any links that you need. And I hope that you enjoy the Goddesses Study Guide. Post your reviews on Amazon. Let us know what how you're working with it, what you think. Post on social media. That's great, too. And most of all, join us for the next webinar. Until then, I hope you experience the power of myth in your life. And I hope the muses inspire you in ever new and ever enlivening ways. Have a great day.